your name and nobody oh. else has a name I'm the only one who forgets that's why yeah. <laughs> no, I'm the one who forgets what time meetings start I need to be told orally the day before I'm just pathetic good morning let's wait just a moment for everyone to be seated well that was impressive Really impressive for an early hour in the morning. I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center. Very happy to be here and not in my last occupation. Um, and it is my honor and my pleasure to welcome Energy Secretary Ernie Moniz to the Wilson Center, as well as the more than 20 brilliant Brazilian and American scientists in Washington today for this symposium. Would all the brilliant American and Brazilian science, scientists please raise your hands? Are you in, the, in this audience? <laughs> you can self-identify, you know. How about just scientists? How about just scientists? <laughs> there we go. He's, Ooh, we go. <laughs> wow. Okay, well, that makes me feel inferior. Uh, I'd also like to recognize Minister uh, uh, Ernesto Araoyo, the Brazilian uh, Embassy's Ch Deputy Chief of Mission, who's right over there. Uh, who is with us this morning representing Ambassador Mauro Vieira. Uh, welcome to Dr. Uh, Celso Laffer, uh, president of the Sao Paulo uh, Science Foundation. He is right there and formerly Brazil's foreign minister. He was with us three years ago when we helped launch uh, FAPESC uh, Week. That initiative, promoting international cooperation in science research, was a wonderful use of the Wilson Center's convening power. Now there have been FAPESC weekends in England, China, Japan, Spain, and Germany so far. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kelso is joined by FAPESC Scientific Director, Dr. Carlos Enrique Brito Cruz, who is there, uh, in advancing uh, those crucial partnerships. Dr. Brito Cruz delivered the keynote here at the Wilson Center for FAPESC Week 2012. Today's event uh, builds on years of friendship between FAPESC and our Brazil Institute. Um, where's the director of our Brazil Institute? There he is, Paulo Sotero, and celebrates innovative collaborations between Brazil and the Department of Energy, like the Green Ocean Amazon Project. Partnership between our two countries drives research on just about every topic under the sun. That word was chosen deliber deliberately. Energy, food, and human security, and how to grow our economies while protecting the only environment we've got. These issues cut to the core of North and South American prosperity. Uh, I personally served on the House Energy and Commerce Committee in Congress, and I can assure you that energy, environmental security is national security. Uh, both Brazil and the United States have taken incredibly encouraging steps in this direction. 
Brazil recently put aside 1.65 million acres of rainforest, an area larger than Delaware, to combat deforestation. And last month, President Obama created a Pacific Marine Reserve covering 490,000 square miles, an area three times the size of California. California, you should know, is the best state in the United States. So the brain power and the resolve in this room today are off the charts. That that applies to the brilliant scientists over there. And that includes some close uh, members of the Wilson Center family. So my good friend Tony Harrington, who's right there, former U.S. Ambassador to Brazil and President of the Brazil Institute's Advisory Board, is also with us today. And so is Dr. Tom Lovejoy, who is there, an incredibly talented biologist and father of biological diversity. He, too, is a very close friend of the Center. Uh, we also welcome to the center uh, Secretary Moniz's brilliant wife. Where's his brilliant wife? Right there, <laughs> Dr. Naomi Moniz, who is Professor Emeritus of Brazilian and Portuguese Literature at Georgetown. That really is impressive, even if you're not a scientist. Are you a scientist too? No. no. Uh, how you put up with his hair, we don't know. Um, she cuts it, that's how. <laughs> I think this is too much information. Did everyone hear what he said? She cuts it. Um, it's a great group and a great program. And now, now I'd like to invite to the podium uh, Dr. Celso Laffer, president of FAPESC. He's a devoted public servant who has twice served Brazil as Minister of Foreign Relations. He's also a former Minister of Development, Industry, and Trade, and he represented his country ably as an ambassador to the United Nations. He wants me to stop, but I'm going to finish this. And to the World Trade Organization. In 2002, he was the recipient, got to say this, of the National Order of Scientific uh, Merit, Brazil's highest award in the scientists. We're thrilled to have him at the Wilson Center kick off uh, today's symposium. Again, thank you to all of you, and please welcome Dr. Celso Laffer. I suppose I should say something. Is that the uh, order of things? Well, I'd like to be uh, very brief and to tell you how we at FAPESP are happy to uh, be once again here uh, at the Wilson Center, uh, thanks to the help and the encouragement of the Brazil Institute and the work of Paulo Sotero. We had, as you mentioned, a very interesting event, which was the first FAPESP week that was held here, which was a, a very important event in our internationalization process. Today we are celebrating something that we consider very special, that is uh, the results that we have, in a certain sense, already achieved in the area of collaborative efforts in terms of research. FAPESP has two uh, outstanding and long-standing programs. One is the BIOTA program, which is related to biodiversity, and the other is the program related to climate change. These uh, efforts that we are going to discuss today are an outreach and a result of that. And we are very happy to do it uh, here at the Wilson Center and to celebrate our work, uh, our common work with the Department of Energy. Uh, these uh, studies and research we will uh, soon examine are a result of a collaboration between FAPESPI the Department of Energy, and also the equivalent of FAPESP in the Amazon, the FAPEM, which uh, uh, is a very interesting way uh, in which uh, we have tied together common efforts and common interests in this area. Uh, let me conclude by saying that uh, there is both uh, a diplomacy for science and a science for diplomacy. Uh, part of this uh, effort is related to a diplomacy related to science. And my view is that researchers uh, share common values regarding the merits of scientific inquiry. They are, as such, stakeholders of a process of cooperation. And in a world that is full of tensions, this is something 
that makes this type of effort also an effort that is related to the construction of understanding and cooperation in a world full of tensions. And I'm very glad to celebrate at this moment here uh, at the Wilson Center with the support of uh, Paulo and his team, uh, this dimension of our understanding with the United States and with the dimension that goes with scientific cooperation. Thank you very much. Well, uh, it's uh, an honor now to uh, have uh, Secretary Muniz ad address the, the group. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Paulo, and uh, thank you, Jane. Uh, the um, uh, Jane, you noted that your your service on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, there seems to be. Uh, uh, not a quite a consistent uh, tone of humor, actually, in the in the hearings these days. But uh, uh, nevertheless, we look forward to to working with them. Also, you uh, uh, rooted for your home team in California. I'll just note that uh, I was a graduate student at Stanford, and uh, the cartoon I had kept posted was a car driving along a road with a sign saying uh, "Leaving California, resume normal behavior." Uh, <laughs> Jane, you have to get the message. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me also add my recognition to uh, uh, Minister Laffer and uh, Ambassador Harrington, who uh, actually, I think, worked together in the science and, di and diplomacy realm, uh, in fact, uh, in the uh, late uh, 1990s. Uh, and uh, my friend Brito, uh, known for quite some, quite some time, uh, and uh, our man of the forest, uh, Tom Lovejoy, who I just learned today actually implemented biodiversity as opposed to naming it. That's it's really, really, really fantastic. Uh, but the, um, uh, it, it's, really, it's really good to be here. The Amazon is clearly um, you know, one of the world's most vital uh, ecosystems, and that's no, no secret to anyone uh, one here. Um, important, really, for, really important uh, globally. Uh, and uh, in many dimensions, certainly that of, of climate change, uh, the kind of the ultimate global, uh, global challenge. And I think, you know, part of the backdrop here um, uh, in that context is that for Brazil and the United States, uh, kind of the two continental scale um, uh, largest economies of North and South America, uh, respectively, this, first of all, there's some good news. I mean, over these last years, uh, we have both seen uh, a reduction uh, in our carbon dioxide emissions. Unfortunately, we've also seen a slight uptick uh, in, the last, uh, in, in, the, in the last year. Uh, our pathways uh, to lower CO2 were different. Uh, in, uh, in Brazil, uh, very much uh, driven by, in fact, how the Amazon uh, is uh, managed and stewarded. Uh, the United States, uh, through uh, some of our energy developments, uh, both on the supply and the demand side. That is, on the supply side, uh, natural gas uh, development, uh, substituting for coal, uh, but also very strong energy efficiency measures on the demand side, uh, such as uh, more, more, uh, uh, more efficient vehicles. Uh, the uptick, uh, of course, we in, in both cases has been associated with, uh, with um, uh, energy production. Uh, and, um, and so in, in, in a sense, we, we really share uh, a challenge uh, going, uh, going forward. Uh, again, as part of context, it's, it's probably worth, worth reemphasizing that in these last years, uh, the Western Hemisphere has been a really active place uh, for energy activities uh, from the n all the way from the north to the south. Uh, the, uh, the Canadian and U.S. Uh, certainly uh, dramatically increased uh, uh, oil and gas production. Uh, 
Uh, Mexico going through a very substantial energy sector reform, renewables throughout Latin America, Brazil, among other things, uh, are looking to develop the pre-salt, and Argentina going to the south in terms of an enormous, the Vaca Muerta, uh, enormous uh, natural gas resource. So, you know, it's, it's, if you think about it, if you go back to the beginning of this century and now, I think in the Western Hemisphere, we, we look at uh, the energy situation in a, in a very different way. Uh, 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 which can be very good for our economies, uh, good for our security. But, of course, we have to manage all of this in the context of addressing uh, the climate challenge uh, that, is, uh, that, is, that is so, so important. You know, here in October, I know you've all been partying uh, for the last month in recognition of National Energy Action Month. Uh, I'm sure you all knew the, of the presidential proclamation issued uh, at the end of September, uh, and um, uh, while, uh, while you've been partying, I've been traveling uh, uh, you know, to New York, Texas, Missouri, Kansas, Nevada, California, the Reagan Center, uh, and um, uh, looking at, at these, these activities. And I might say there was a, there was a very interesting, actually, in Texas uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, I was uh, uh, keynoting a, 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 a conference on innovation called South by Southwest Eco. And uh, the, the happy coincidence uh, is that my introduction uh, uh, ended up being a short film clip, uh, a two-minute uh, clip uh, uh, produced by, the, by Conservation International as one of a series of clips uh, with the theme uh, of Nature Speaks. And it was uh, prominent uh, uh, personalities, uh, Harrison Ford uh, taking the role of, you know, the ocean or uh, another major, major Earth system. And, uh, and for my introduction, it was Kevin Spacey uh, as the rainforest. Uh, so I think very appropriate uh, as, we, uh, as we come to this, uh, to this meeting. Uh, and then uh, another happy coincidence, uh, um, our, our uh, friend here also in the first row, Denise Milan, a, an artist who uh, has been working on nature speaking uh, and the rainforest for, for years. And then earlier this month at the Kennedy Center, um, uh, producing the opera, opera Florencia in the Amazon. So this has been a role on the Amazon. Somebody is giving us a message uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we have to pay attention and that this meeting is clearly very important. So in this meeting, uh, obviously, uh, we all know we need uh, uh, the very best science, the very best scientists. Uh, there was that modesty when you didn't respond to the call for uh, the really uh, top scientists, but we know you are, uh, to understand the changes taking place in our, in our rainforests uh, uh, and the effect that climate is having and will have uh, on these ecosystems uh, globally uh, and how, how do we best uh, uh, preserve them. And that's, of course, where, where all of you come in uh, and uh, uh, as... Um, uh, President Laffer said uh, uh, we are very pleased uh, at the Department of Energy uh, to be a partner and to continue this partnership uh, on this, uh, on this uh, science. So I'll just say a few words uh, today about, uh, we'll get to so some, of the, uh, some of the collaborations, but I also want to touch a little bit on our broader efforts here uh, in terms of, terms of addressing climate change. Uh, the, uh, this is a critical period as we feel, uh, uh, in, we feel in the run-up to uh, the meeting in Paris uh, via, via Peru uh, because uh, basically uh, I th we think that uh, we really need, it's a, it, we need a transformational moment as to how we globally all work together uh, on, uh, on, the ca on the challenge of climate change. We just don't have time to go through another five or six year cycle of not, uh, of not moving forward. So, the, uh, again, this audience, uh, once again, I don't have to tell uh, uh, about the importance of, of rainforests, about the Amazon in, uh, in, in particular, uh, and its role in, uh, in global, uh, the global ecosystem, uh, absorbing CO2, producing oxygen, uh, known, uh, the Amazon basin known as the lungs of the world for, for, for good reason. Uh, the, the resource certainly has been under strain, and, and globally we still see a lot of uh, rainforest uh, uh, challenges. We know what deforestation of uh, rainforest means in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, f feedback loops, uh, temperature and climate, uh, altering precipitation patterns, uh, uh, and reducing ecosystem 
uh, services. Uh, so again, uh, we in the, the U.S. government is is very pleased to engage uh, in uh, in this research in in the Amazon basin uh, to in in increase our our scientific understanding and ultimately contribute to conservation uh, of this resource. Specifically, the Green Ocean Amazon uh, Program, Go Amazon, uh, uh, is is one that we uh, really support. The department has deployed. Our, our atmospheric uh, radiation measurement climate research mobile facility to Manacapuru, uh, Brazil, uh, where it will remain through the end of, of next year. Uh, and, and giving researchers, some of whom uh, clearly are here, uh, unprecedented capacity to observe aerosol, cloud, and precipitation interactions uh, in the Amazon basin. Uh, Complementary ecosystem measurements will also provide information on the processes that control emissions of organic compounds uh, from tropical vegetation. We also deployed aircraft, G1 aircraft, to sample aerosol properties uh, during the wet and dry seasons, uh, again, to better understand how chemical processes uh, between biogenic emissions from the rainforest, pollutant outflow from the tropical megacity, Manaus, uh, how they uh, can uh, interact and disturb uh, aerosol uh, formation and properties. I was very pleased when I was in Brasilia uh, uh, a year ago, August, August 2013, it was very uh, felicitous that uh, 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 in a, a meeting with uh, Minister Rop, uh, we were able to confirm Brazil's approval at that time of these overflights for the Go Amazon uh, project. And I know early results are, are emerging from these programs, uh, including uh, measurement of, of increased ozone levels, clarification of hydroxyl levels, uh, seasonal shifts in atmospheric uh, uh, particles uh, associated with the Manaus uh, plume. So as part of this collaborative effort uh, with Brazilian researchers to better understand atmospheric and ecological interactions, uh, we have also just uh, awarded uh, nearly $6 million uh, for six research projects uh, to focus on climate predictability, both regionally and globally uh, across uh, the tropics. Now, these, these investments are clearly uh, uh, a small part of a, of a very large uh, U.S. effort to address uh, climate. And on, and on the home front, uh, uh, the president last year, June 2013, uh, issued uh, a climate action plan uh, that sets out uh, our efforts in three dimensions. Uh, mitigation uh, of climate change risks, reducing greenhouse gas emissions fundamentally. Uh, secondly, adaptation to what we are already seeing as the impacts of global warming and climate change, and finally, uh, international uh, cooperation. Uh, these are three areas that uh, we hope uh, to extend uh, our collaboration uh, with, uh, with Brazil. On the mitigation front, I'm not going to go through a long description of what we're doing, but let me just say uh, very importantly, and this maybe goes back to the original, again, comments by our uh, host, uh, uh, Jane Harmon, uh, that uh, the president expressed very clearly uh, the preference for working with, Congre with, working with Congress uh, in a uh, kind of a government-wide, economy-wide uh, approach uh, to, to climate. Uh, but in the absence uh, of that uh, partnership, uh, he also emphasized that uh, we can't wait, we're not going to wait. Uh, and so the Climate Action Plan issued last year is comprehensive to the extent it can be using only existing authorities in the executive branch. Now that in its, that uh, does provide restrictions. Uh, it, it, it requires more sectoral approaches. Uh, but on the other hand, the flip side of it is by definition, it means we have the authorities, and what I want to make it very clear is we will execute on that plan, and we are executing on that plan. Whether it's the EPA uh, in issuing uh, its, uh, its proposed rules for emissions from power plants, uh, aiming at a 30 percent uh, reduction, whether it's uh, having much, much more aggressive vehicle efficiency standards, uh, especially light-duty vehicles at the moment by 2025, heavy-duty vehicle rules coming, uh, coming, coming soon, uh, or the, the Department of Energy, 
uh, aggressively pursuing efficiency standards. We have issued twice the number of standards in half the time compared to the preceding years, uh, and we'll continue to do that because, again, we have the authority to do it. Uh, we will use our convening power. Uh, for example, we have 11 percent uh, of the country's uh, industrial manufacturing footprint in our Better Plants Challenge uh, for 20 percent reductions in, in energy efficiency. Technology innovation, in many ways, our sweet spot, uh, pursuing cost reduction of clean energy technologies. Our loan program, uh, we have $30 billion in play uh, to advance innovation and deployment of clean energy technologies. A lot of people know that. Fewer people know that we have $40 billion in remaining authority, and we have every intention of, of using that. So uh, just the, to note that we will be uh, uh, ambitious uh, in, moving, in, uh, in moving this forward. Now, uh, adaptation is the second pillar of that plan. Uh, that's an issue for us. It's an issue for Brazil. It's an issue for uh, many, many countries, of course. Uh, uh, and that goes all the way from uh, preparing for the inevitable increase in things like major storm surges, uh, threatening energy infrastructure, and other, of course, uh, critical services in society, uh, to, uh, de to designing the energy infrastructure of the future, uh, which will not only be more transactional for the economy, but will be more resilient to threats, be they extreme weather or cyber or physical or geomagnetic, you name it. Uh, that's the kind of program that we are, uh, we are looking at. And of course, international collaboration, as I've already said, the road to Paris is a, uh, is a, is a critical one. Uh, we are working actively with a number of countries. Uh, we are looking to Paris uh, to have uh, ambitious, inclusive, durable, and fair national approaches put forward uh, in that, uh, in that uh, context. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, we are executing on our own program and, uh, and um, uh, we'll, we'll continue to, uh, to do so. Clearly, in order to reach an agreement uh, that will satisfy our needs, uh, we will need developing countries, emerging economies, developed nations, all on board, uh, understandably with differentiated approaches, but the hope is, again, everybody in the, in the framework of being ambitious, <laughs> durable, uh, 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 fair. So um, again, it's an area that we certainly hope uh, to be working with um, uh, Brazil and, uh, and many of our other, other, other friends. Um, certainly, U.S.-Brazil energy cooperation is not something new. We've, uh, we've been doing that in a number of areas, uh, in biofuels, for example. Uh, we've worked closely to uh, promote biofuels development in our, in our two countries. Uh, uh, we are kind of the big guys on the block uh, uh, here in terms of, in terms of uh, biofuels. Uh, and also, for example, close collaboration in specific areas like uh, future uh, aviation. Uh, biofuels. Energy efficiency, another area of, co of collaboration. One, you know, just one example, Department of Energy, again, uh, collaborating uh, with our Brazilian partners. Uh, we are working to establish uh, an independent testing laboratory at the Federal University of Santa Catarina uh, to provide efficiency ratings uh, for windows and other, other building, building components. Uh, we're working with uh, CPEL, uh, the Electric Power uh, research uh, center uh, to assess approaches to improved energy efficiency in industrial plants. Again, good for the environment, good for the economy uh, in terms of providing a competitive edge. Shale oil and gas is, a, uh, uh, is an area where the United States, of course, is, uh, and, and Canada uh, are, are well out in front, uh, but again, Brazil with a substantial interest uh, in how this, uh, how this might develop in an area where we are certainly uh, very happy to co cooperate in any way that's helpful uh, to bring to bear the vast experience uh, that we've acquired in the United States uh, in, in developing this. And, uh, and in fact, we are working with the Ministry of Mines and Energy to share best practices uh, uh, for, for, for Brazil. Uh, one of the most important forums that we've had uh, going on over these last years uh, has been the U.S.-Brazil uh, Strategic Energy Dialogue, 
which was uh, launched by, uh, by Presidents Obama and Rousseff in 2011. Uh, and um, uh, we believe this can remain an important mechanism, uh, and uh, we are uh, eager um, to uh, set a date uh, for uh, and to host, it's our turn, to host uh, the next meeting of the dialogue here in Washington, D.C., uh, 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 hopefully early, uh, early in the next year. So, in conclusion, again, as I said earlier, you know, our countries, we're the largest economies of North and South America, respectively, uh, continental in scale, leaders in energy in, in multiple dimensions, and I think with, with shared values in environmental stewardship. Uh, and so we hope that this uh, Go Amazon uh, collaboration uh, will be one of the continuing contributors uh, to a vibrant uh, partnership advancing our national agendas and our global aspirations. Thank you and best wishes for a successful meeting. Well, uh, it is my pleasure now to invite to the podium uh, uh, Dr. Brito Cruz uh, to start uh, the, uh, the conference, the symposium on uh, collaborative research on the Amazon. Dr. Brito Cruz, please. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here for this uh, FAPESP United States Collaborative Research on the Amazon Symposium. And in the next few minutes, I want to give you a brief idea of uh, how we work at the Sao Paulo Research Foundation and about the efforts that we have been doing there in the state of Sao Paulo to develop a thriving science and technology system around universities and uh, research institutions in the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil. I <coughs> should say that, of course, this is not done in isolation from the world and from Brazil. We have very, very important partners in Brazil, in the national government, in other states. Uh, as an example, many of the results that will be presented here today in this symposium uh, come from uh, collaboration not only between the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, FAPESP, and the Department of Energy or the National Science Foundation, but also our uh, sister agency, which is the Amazonas Research Foundation, we have their science director here, Andrea. Andrea, raise your hand there. Yeah. And it's a pleasure to work with the Amazonas Research Foundation in this, uh, in the, all those projects in, in this uh, endeavor. We have other partners here, like uh, researchers from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, with which FAPESP also has an agreement for the exchange of scientists and collaborations. And 
uh, we are extremely happy that right after this talk, uh, we are going to sign an agreement for research cooperation with the Smithsonian Institution, uh, represented here by John Grass, who is right here in the first row. So, John, we might consider that this talk is the last obstacle before having <laughs> <laughs> research <laughs> collaboration between FAPESP and the uh, Smithsonian. So, uh, the s state of Sao Paulo in Brazil <coughs> is one of the 26 Brazilian states. It is in the southeast region of Brazil. Uh, it's a, a state which has a population of 41 million people. So, in size of population, the state of Sao Paulo is more or less the size of Argentina or the size of Spain. The economy of the state of Sao Paulo responds for about one-third of Brazil's GDP, uh, which makes the economy of the state of Sao Paulo larger than the economy of Argentina and slightly smaller than the economy of Spain. So that's just to give you some context about the, the region and about the fact that it is a region which is strongly industrialized, which has a very efficient and uh, also strong agricultural system, and which has been building a science system for the last 100 years that is now uh, giving important results for uh, Brazil. Uh, uh, a testimony to the importance that the state of Sao Paulo gives to supporting research is that every year about 13% of the state expenditures from fiscal revenues in the state are geared towards higher education and research. The state has a number of research institutions, uh, research organizations, universities, and if you add expenditures from the state government, the federal government, and industry, uh, the expenditures in research in the state of Sao Paulo add to about 1.6% of the regional GDP, which is an intensity comparable to the 1.8% of the European Union. So it's, a, it's an intense system for uh, research and development. The state has some pride in having three state universities. In Brazil, there are federal universities which are funded by the national government of Brazil. They are in many regions, many states of Brazil. And a few states in Brazil, especially the state of Sao Paulo, decided many years ago to have their own university system funded by the state taxpayer. The state of Sao Paulo has three state universities which are among the best research universities in Brazil. The University of Sao Paulo, the University of Campinas, and the University of the state of Sao Paulo. Just to give you a, a size, the University of Sao Paulo every year graduates 2,400 PhDs. I think it's probably the, the university in the world that graduates the largest number of PhDs every year. The University of Campinas and the University of the State of Sao Paulo, they graduate 900 PhDs every year. So they are strong research universities with uh, very well qualified uh, faculty. And uh, not only the state of Sao Paulo has those three state universities, but also it, is, it hosts four very important higher education institutions which are funded and maintained and uh, managed by the federal government of Brazil. There are three federal universities, smaller than the state universities, but very important, very well qualified too. And the Aeronautics Technology Institute, which is the main and the best uh, engineering uh, undergraduate school in, in Brazil, which is, for example, one of the results of the Aeronautics Technology Institute is that Embraer, which is now the third largest aircraft manufacturer in the world, is a spin-out of the Aeronautics Technology Institute, ITA. Uh, the state has also a network of 52 higher education technical schools, which would be like, badly comparing, but for shortness, like community colleges, except they are geared towards technology. Um, and 
the state of Sao Paulo, as a result, responds for about 45% of the 14,000 PhDs which graduate every year in Brazil. So almost half of the PhDs graduated in Brazil every year graduate in a university in uh, the state of Sao Paulo. Also, the state of Sao Paulo has a network of 22 uh, mission-oriented research institutes. 19 of those institutes are funded by the state taxpayer, and three of those are funded by the federal taxpayer. Uh, as an example, there is the National Space Research Institute, INPE, there is the Aeronautics Technology Center, and there is the National Synchrotron Light Source. So that's more or less the, the landscape for uh, research in the state of Sao Paulo, and part of this <coughs> set of institutions is the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, FAPESP, which is a public foundation funded by the state taxpayer through an uh, ingenious legislation, uh, which I have not seen anywhere else in the world. The constitution of the state has an article that establishes that 1% of all state revenues belong to this foundation. So that gives the foundation a sizable degree of autonomy and stability. Because, for example, the foundation never has to negotiate a budget with the governor or with the state senate. The constitution awards us 1% of whatever money the state makes. Uh, not only that, but as a legacy of the years of high inflation in Brazil, uh, actually the Constitution states that the state is supposed to transfer this money every month. So every month there is an injection of funds to the foundation based on the estimate that the state makes about their, uh, rev their, their fiscal revenues. Uh, the foundation is supposed to, and has the mission and does that, to support research in all fields. So it is a research foundation, it's not a science foundation. So we fund research in the arts, in literature, in philosophy, and we fund research in biochemistry, in astrophysics, chemical engineering, in all fields. Uh, we do that by receiving proposals from researchers. Researchers, the principal investigators, must be associated to an institution, a university or a research institution in the state of Sao Paulo. And uh, they submit proposals and we analyze the proposals using a peer reviewing system. It's not uncommon for us to request that the proposals be submitted in English so that re we can use reviewers anywhere uh, in the world. In 2013, we received 25,000 proposals. And we have some pride in the fact that uh, the average time between receiving a proposal and sending a letter with a decision to the proposer was 65 days in 2013, which is pretty fast. It might not be the letter the researcher wanted. <laughs> But it is a decision. Actually, in, in last year, in 45% of the cases, it was the letter the researcher wanted, which is a pretty good uh, success rate for a funding agency any, anywhere. Uh, in 2013, we spent around $500 uh, million, dollars, which were spent in four main strands of research funding. One of them is fellowships. It is very important for us in Sao Paulo, and it's very important in Brazil, to train the next generation of scientists, uh, especially because in our system of science, the number of scientists needs to grow with time, and needs to grow with some speed. So uh, every last year, every month, FAPES paid 12,000 people to work in research. Some of them are undergraduate students, some are graduate students, some are postdocs, uh, which is an important contribution because it adds to the research system in Sao Paulo about 40% of the number of faculty that we have. So we, we, we make a, a substantial increase in the system. Uh, that uses up around 35 to 40% of our money. 
Then there is a, a strand which is academic research and development, which in our definition would be what here in the States you would call investigator-initiated research. It is research projects in which we do not tell the researcher what they are going to do or the theme, or it's their decision. They write a proposal, they submit. Actually, they can submit any days. We do not have any day. We do not have deadlines. Whenever a proposal comes in, we analyze the proposal with the reviewers, with the committees and everything. Uh, we fund that through two-year grants, five-year grants, and 11-year grants. Of course, we have more of the two-year grants, like 3,000 of those ongoing now. 400 of the five-year grants, which are for bolder research, more complex uh, approach to research, usually a team of two to five PIs. And we also have a program in which we offer funding for 11 years for centers that will tackle a really difficult and complex theme in which they need a longer time to be able to deliver high impact results. Longer time would be the 11 years. And we also have this program which we call Young Investigators, in which we offer for a young investigator, young would be a person who has been a postdoc for three to five years outside Brazil, who is willing to start a career in the state of Sao Paulo as a researcher. We offer for this person full funding for them to start their research laboratory. That includes equipment, travel, consumables, fellowships for students that will work with that person. Uh, many times those young investigator awards are multi-million uh, dollar awards which last for four years. We have already brought more than 1,000 young investigators to the state of Sao Paulo to start their science careers there with this uh, young investigator program. And the third strand of our funding uh, would be what we do together with industry. It's our university industry joint research and development program in which FAPESP associates to a company to jointly fund that usually is in matching fund basis, one dollar from FAPES, one dollar from the company, to fund research that will be performed at a university in the state of Sao Paulo and which has results relevant for that company. Uh, those are some of the companies we associate with. Actually, the list has more than 100 companies. And those can be two-year grants. And in some cases, they, they can be centers, research centers, which are 10-year grants, like the one we just announced with Peugeot Citroën, which is a biofuel uh, engine. Uh, for automobiles research center hosted at the University of Campinas funded by FAPESP and by Peugeot Citroën. We are now due to announce two centers with GlaxoSmithKline on green chemistry and on uh, target discovery and another one with a Brazilian company Natura which is a cosmetics uh, manufacturing company about the well-being of people. Cosmetic manufacturers want to know what makes people feel good. So we want to do research on that, that's okay. We partner with them and we help them to do that research. So that's our university industry joint research program. Then we have a program in which we fund research in small business. It would be comparable to the small business innovative research program that many agencies here in the state have. Uh, we already supported more than 1,000 small businesses in the state of Sao Paulo. Some of them made real good results out of the funding we awarded to them. They were small companies like $200,000 a year companies and they became $50 million companies through two or three of our funding generating thousands of jobs for engineers, researchers, scientists in the state of Sao Paulo. Last year we awarded three of those awards for to small businesses every, every week. Uh, FAPESP has a, a portfolio of funding which is uh, strong in health sciences. That's your chance to learn some words in Portuguese. I apologize for that. <laughs> anyway, Saúde would be health. That's 30% of our funding. 
and then there is biology, which is 16% of our funding. If you add agronomy and veterinary, which is down here at 9%, more than half of our money goes into the life sciences. And the rest goes into humanities and social sciences, which is an important uh, slice of our funding with 10%, uh, engineering, chemistry, physics, and uh, other fields. Uh, the support for research in the state of Sao Paulo generates, for example, not only results, as I was mentioning, of impact for industry and for the economy, but also results which are relevant in terms of intellectual impact. Researchers in the state of Sao Paulo uh, create more scientific articles every year than researchers in any other country in Latin America. So it's almost the, the number of papers published by authors in the state of Sao Paulo is almost twice as much as those in Mexico or Argentina, uh, almost three times as those in Chile, Colombia, and Venezuela. So it's a, it's a place where a lot of research is conducted and promoted, and there are results. This is just an illustration of some uh, collection of covers of good scientific journals which highlighted research funded by FAPESP in several topics. You will see there, uh, for example, the Amazon here, that was this year. I will comment on this a little bit later. Cancer research, uh, molecular biology, invertebrate systematics, nanotechnology, physics, chemistry, cardiology, so in many, many fields. Um, we uh, at FAPESP have this idea that, of course, we like science that makes business more competitive. We like science that uh, heals sick people. We like science that makes poor people become rich. But most especially, we like science that helps to make mankind wiser. So we do not ask too many questions of the scientists about the applications of their science. We want that science to be good. Good meaning to be competitive internationally, to, ha to bring new ideas, to have a, an impact in uh, the research uh, landscape in the, in the world. So we fund research in astrophysics. That's a telescope we participate in building in uh, Chile, which made studies, for example, about the origins of the universe. That's the kind of research in which they are not going to create a small business or a large business. They are going to answer questions which are relevant for all of us. How did the universe begin? And they did that in this case by studying the explosion of a, a supernova that happened 13 billion years ago. 13 billion years ago, the universe was not yet 1 billion years old. And by looking at that light, which must be a special thing, right, to be in a telescope and see the explosion of a star that exploded 13 billion years ago. But looking at that light, they can learn which were the elements which existed, what was the proportion of lithium, hydrogen, helium, iron, and so on, and how the elements were being formed as the universe was uh, evolving. We fund research in archaeology, uh, for example, uh, looking at this question, how did man end up in America? There, are, there is a dispute in the literature about how did this happen, if there was one migration, two migrations, when they did happen. Uh, so researchers at the University of Sao Paulo contribute to this uh, understanding. We have a special program. That is, in the past, other than funding research in all fields, we, when we want to emphasize a certain topic, we create a special program for that, which congregates a number of scientists. One of them is our BIOTA program, in which we have a network of more than 300 scientists working in biodiversity-related research. So they study things like the functional extinction of birds, which drives evolutionary changes in seed size. How the, if the birds, large birds become extinct, then the seeds, the large seeds will move less, then that will affect the population of plants in a, in a forest or in a connected forest because most forests are, are made of small pieces which are sometimes connected, sometimes not connected. But th that's the kind of article that answers to, uh, answers 
fundamental questions about evolution, about the workings of a forest, about biodiversity. And the interesting thing for us, very interesting, is that the same scientists who do this work, they work together with the government in the state of Sao Paulo to assist the government in writing conservation legislation. So we have a very nice collection of laws and decrees in the state of Sao Paulo, again here in Portuguese, but I'll translate this sentence for you. You cannot read it anyway because it's very small. But it says here, considering the results obtained by the team of researchers in the Biota FAPESP program, the governor decrees that, Article 1, Article 2, Article 3. So it's legislation directly and explicitly based in science. It's something that doesn't happen every day anywhere in the world, and we are proud to have this kind of contribution to the uh, conservation uh, actions in the state of Sao Paulo. We work with companies, we work it with Embraer to develop the computational fluid dynamics of this plane which is now flying all over the world here in the US. Interesting thing for us is that the figure on the left was in a report they submitted to us three years before the first plane was built. So it's a model simulation of the plane, how it was going to be when they tested the plane a number of years after. We have research in health sciences, vaccines research. There is a, a very important project that we fund, which is working, trying to develop an anti-AIDS uh, vaccine, which was already tested with uh, success in monkeys. Now the next step is to test in humans. And, of course, we have a growing portfolio of research on the Amazon. It is a, a relevant topic for us because the Amazon is relevant for Brazil and relevant for the world. It's also uh, relevant in the sense that it connects to the three, to the to two of the three main programs that FAPESP has. One is the biodiversity program that I just mentioned, Biota, and another one is the global climate change program that we have, we, which also congregates around 100 scientists, maybe 300 uh, PhDs and master students in several institutions. So our portfolio of research about the Amazon, the blue line shows the number of grants and the red line shows the number of fellowships for students. So you will see that we have more than doubled the number of fellowships for students. We have had a, a sizable increase in the number of grants. And uh, those uh, grants and fellowships uh, initiate, that's a, a plot showing how many initiated each year. You will see that every year we have about almost one grant per week funding research about the Amazon, which is approved by FAPESP. And we have a number which would be like three, almost three, between two and three fellowships every week, which are approved by FAPESP involving research on the Amazon. That's research on the Amazon in all fields that might be uh, the biodiversity of the Amazon, it might be studi studying microorganisms that were found in the Amazon, it might be uh, 18th century literature about the Amazon. So the portfolio is broad and many times we find unexpected connections between the, the different grants and the different topics and, uh, and teams. Uh, one of the illustrations, and I have chosen to show this one here because it's a, it's a paper that will not be presented here because for this session today we have chosen the ones which are in collaboration between scientists in Sao Paulo and colleagues in the U.S. And in this case it was a collaboration between FAPESP and the Natural Environmental Research Council of the U.K. which uh, appeared in Nature this year, was highlighted in the cover, uh, bringing additional contribution to this old question, is the Amazon a sink or a source? Sometimes it's a sink, sometimes it's a source, it depends on how much water do you have. So they, they, what they did were several, a large number of flights over the Amazon to map the concentration of uh, carbon uh, oxide, of oxygen, of water vapor, connected that uh, with the rain 
uh, information with the humidity information and brought their contribution to this uh, important question relating drought sensitivity of Amazonian carbon balance revealed by atmospheric measurement. So that's one of the examples of several others that might be found. I will uh, finish here just by mentioning that FAPESP has been developing a strong program of international collaboration uh, and this uh, little map shows that uh, everything in the world converges to the state of Sao Paulo as you <laughs> see there. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, that's uh, lines that show the, the collaborations that we have with funding agencies and with universities and with research institutions in uh, several uh, countries through which we have been developing a growing portfolio of collaboration in several fields, in the humanities, in physics, in bioenergy, in chemistry. So we are kind of agnostic with respect, to, with respect to the topic. What we are looking at now are strategies to develop more interaction between science in the state of Sao Paulo and science in places in the world where science is relevant. So any topic suits our, our, our strategy and actually the number of grants that we have cover different uh, topics. Those are some of the organizations with which we partner now. Uh, all the seven research councils in the UK, the DFG in Germany, Fraunhofer, ANR in France. We have a number of projects in oceanography with ANR, also with DFG. With RCUK, we have many projects in biology, biochemistry, in uh, environment. Uh, we also have a growing portfolio here in the United States with the National Science Foundation, which has been our very, very good partner in their dimensions of biodiversity program. We have a, a growing uh, portfolio of uh, projects of five-year grants in this uh, collaboration in other topics too, companies. In Portugal, we have a special collaboration with the Fundação de Ciência e Tecnologia, Finland, Denmark, Spain, Argentina. So those collaborations are growing. It's, uh, there are many more than those which are shown here. Uh, and we also offer in the state of Sao Paulo opportunities for uh, postdocs. We bring postdocs from anywhere in the world to be postdocs in the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, last year, 40% of the postdoctoral fellowships we approved in the field of physics were for people coming from other countries moving to Brazil to be researchers there in the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, all in all, in all fields, 20% of the fellowships were for foreigners. Our fellowships are not for Brazilians. They are for smart people wherever they come from. Uh, so that's the postdoctoral fellowship program, which has a 46% success rate. We awarded 1,000 fellowships in 2013. And finally, I will comment on the Young Investigator Awards, uh, which is, uh, as I mentioned, a five-year grant. Goes from $200,000 to maybe $2 million, depending on the field. Some people need equipment, more expensive things, some people need less expensive things. And it's a program geared, geared at bringing young uh, investigators to start a career in the state of Sao Paulo, in any organization. If the person has an organization in view, it's okay. If they just want to come there to start, we can assist them in finding a university or a research lab in which they will fit well. But it's a program for the person to be the PI. It's not for a young investigator to work for somebody, to have a supervisor. The, the PI will be the leader of the research and will have the funding and the checkbook and the expenses and make all the, all the decisions related to, to, the, to the project. Last year we approved 72 of those, which is one and a half per week during the year. Uh, information is at uh, this uh, website, which is in the bottom in our website in English. And just to finish, I want to mention that uh, we have at FAPESP this newsletter, which brings news about research, 
science and technology in the state of Sao Paulo and in Brazil, which is uh, freely distributed in English. Anyone interested can subscribe at this website, agencia.fapesp.br slash en. Uh, it comes every week. Actually, we distribute this every day in Brazil, in Portuguese, and every week we make a special number with some of the news that go uh, to our to any addresses in uh, in the world. So the uh, the idea here is that, in closing, the Sao Paulo Research Foundation uh, works uh, strongly to develop research in the state of Sao Paulo. We work with universities, with research institutions, with small businesses, with large businesses, and. Uh, other than funding research submitted by researchers in the state of Sao Paulo, we are looking at opportunities to develop collaborations between those scientists and their colleagues elsewhere in the world. And that's why we are here at the Wilson Center this time, and that's why in a few moments we are going to sign uh, an agreement between FAPESP and the Smithsonian Institution, and that is why we came here today to display the results of some of the grants that we have on FAPESP-funded research about the Amazon, which is so relevant for Brazil and for the world. Thank you very much. Well, uh, you just, uh, if you didn't know, you just learned uh, about FAPES, what a treasure it is. There is a treasure in this town, it's called the Smithsonian Institution. And I would like to invite the president of uh, FAPES, uh, Celso Laffer. I would like to invite the acting under secretary of the Smithsonian Institution for Science, John Grass, to come to the stage for the signing. I would like to have some witnesses here. Jane Harmon, uh, Dr. Lovejoy, uh, Anthony Harrington, Arau uh, uh, Ernesto Araujo, the DCM, and I'd like to also uh, ask uh, Carlos uh, Eduardo Lins da Silva, who is a global fellow of the Brazil Institute here and also associated with FAPEP. So uh, please, uh, I think, John. We, okay. need, we need some witnesses. <laughs> Please. Okay. Yes. Okay. So. So. so, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I think <laughs> now, it's already uh, I believe now we are going to continue. Uh, and I will change uh, the uh, people here. I would like to call uh, Dr. Paulo Artacho and Dr. Scott Martin uh, to the podium to start the next session. And so just There is coffee, but not now. You, you have to. <laughs> now, it, now it work. Okay, okay. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here with you today and uh, kick off a uh, description of the Go Amazon uh, experiment. 
Um, I'm uh, Scott Martin, um, and I'm here on behalf of a number of Brazil and USA and other uh, international partners uh, to tell you about uh, what we've been doing with uh, Go Amazon, which I guess started as a, a pre-proposal in April of 2010, and here we are four, four and a half uh, years later. So it's been uh, an exciting uh, project to be involved with. I wonder, uh, with the lights here, if, if they were dimmed, if we might be able to see the screen a little better. Is that possible? Well, that's impossible. Well, that's possible. Very good. Okay. So, um, what are we doing in uh, uh, Go Amazon uh, experiment, uh, which is set, uh, surprisingly enough, in uh, Amazonia? Okay. Um, we are interested in carbon cycle, cloud life cycle, aerosol life cycle, and we're interested in the connections to anthropogenic activities uh, in, into each of these. In particular, as we uh, kind of think through what we're doing as a, as a human civilization, we know in many metrics we have been greatly accelerating over the last uh, 15, 20, 50 years, uh, going from fossil fuel usage to fertilizer consumption to water use. This acceleration is uh, many, many fold. Um, this process is kind of starting in the Amazonas uh, 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 basin. Um, there's a large city of uh, Manaus. There are various development plans over the years for other, for other cities within uh, uh, Amazonia. And a question emerges both for the planet but also more uh, locally for, for Amazonia. Um, what, are, what are kind of the limits? How, how far can we push the system? How might the system uh, develop in many aspects? Uh, the most famous one, of course, is kind of the forest dieback scenario. Uh, but there are many other uh, uh, perturbations. And through the Go Amazon experiment, we're trying to get that type of information. This is a review article that appeared in uh, Nature uh, uh, magazine a few years ago, uh, emphasizing how the Amazon basin is in uh, transition. Um, again, fires, logging, these are kind of the famous examples. But of course, if you uh, have a large city that's polluting and putting out particles into the atmosphere, putting out oxides of nitrogen in the atmosphere, oxides of nitrogen uh, are, are coupled into ozone production. Ozone, uh, of course, interacts, we know in the U.S. at least, with crop damage, um, particle production. Uh, Amazonia is a, a region of the planet very sensitive to total number of particles per cubic centimeter. When clouds form, the water and the gas phase doesn't condense onto nothing. It condenses on the pre-existing submicron particles. Um, and if you have the same amount of liquid water condensing on 300 particles versus 3,000 particles, 3,000 being the anthropogenic case, uh, then the average cloud droplet is much smaller. Chances of precipitation are much different. Uh, so you get tie-ins of the hydrologic cycle. And you begin to set up these types of, of questions of uh, are the plants making the particles, making the rain, making the plants? Uh, and you have this, this, in some ways, Gaia-type hypothesis. And you wonder what these uh, uh, connections of carbon flows, water flows, energy flows, how accelerating human activities might be disrupting each one of those uh, cycles. Um, how much can we understand that in, in advance, meaning through the Go Amazon experiment, how much can we understand that in advance to, do, uh, uh, to, to, to provide uh, kind of the, the baseline information to people who are making uh, policy decisions about development in the Amazon basin. Some of that's under Brazil government control. Then, of course, there's the larger issue of global climate change, which is a forcing function on, on, on Amazonia, and how will that larger scale climate change affect Amazonia as well. So um, that really sets up the ultimate goal uh, of the Go Amazon, um, which is to estimate future changes and in, in, in things that uh, scientists talk about as direct, indirect, uh, radiative forcing. This means, uh, uh, to large measure, uh, how clouds are affected, um, energy distributions, regional climate, ecosystem functionings, and both how uh, the Amazon's affected by global climate, but at the same time in the southern hemisphere, um, the, the Amazon is a heat engine, meaning many jewels in the southern hemisphere go through Amazonia. So Amazonia is a large enough scale to actually affect southern hemisphere climate as well, kind of with tele, tele, teleconnections. Okay, so with that as kind of the big picture of what we're trying to do through, through Go Amazon, what uh, are, are, are we doing with the research sites, kind of setting up the experiment in more detail? So here is uh, South America continent, I think everyone knows. Um, sitting in the center of it is uh, Brazil, uh, or is, is Manaus, which I believe uh, just had an anniversary, if I'm not wrong about that, just had an anniversary, and is, is it 350 years, is that right? 
just celebrated 350 years. So uh, it was a large, uh, uh, very involved in the rubber uh, industry uh, as well. Now it's a free trade zone, uh, uh, meaning many Fortune 500 companies have manufacturing there. It's growing very quickly. Population, I think, if I'm not wrong, in the early 70s on order of uh, uh, several hundred thousand and just over two million uh, uh, today. A lot of net immigration, fi around 50,000 people a year uh, moving to uh, Manaus. And it's at the flux of the two great rivers that, that start the named Amazonas. Um, if you follow the water molecules, the, the water starts up in uh, the, the Andes, uh, but the named Amazonas is where the two main tributaries meet. So zooming in a little bit, I'll tell you a little bit about T1, T3 here in a second. Zooming in a little bit more. Okay, so here's the city of Manaus on order of 2 million people. We have a number of research sites. Those labeled T0 are kind of upwind of Manaus and are the clean sites. Steady trade winds come in across the Atlantic, spend about three days, um, then hit the Andes, uh, go south, end up in kind of the breadbasket of Sao Paulo, Argentina, the, the wheat areas, meaning any changes in the hydrological cycle in Amazonas have very uh, strong implications for the food supply in, in South America. Okay, T1, time one, uh, is Manaus. Time two uh, is just across the river, so fresh pollution from Manaus. And time three is uh, about four to six hours with, with wind speeds downwind. Uh, most of the, the, the DOE uh, uh, instrumentation uh, from the climate research facility is at uh, T3. We'll hear over the next day and tomorrow a number of, uh, of uh, uh, talks about the T0 sites. Um, uh, uh, Paolo Artasha, who's, who's speaking next, will tell you about some of the cross-cutting information from these comparative uh, research sites. Um, and so the idea is we have background information, how the Amazonia is without pollution influence, source function in Manaus, fresh pollution, and downwind pollution. And the aircraft is kind of flying along this plume for, for the most part, and we'll hear more from Jay Wang and Luis Machado about, about those uh, aspects. Okay, so zooming in a little bit more, T1, T2, T3, the, the, the plume uh, with steady trade winds goes from east uh, to west. And so the basic idea here is that plume is east to west, but how often is T3 in that plume? Because the plume goes a little to the north, a little to the south, a little to the north, a little to the south. So in an ideal case, half the time we're getting uh, the pollution plume and half the time we're in, uh, clean, uh, we're in clean air. And that sets up what we call a natural laboratory. It allows us to assess uh, by being uh, outside the pollution plume how uh, the, 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 the ecosystem, the climate, aerosol life cycle, cloud life cycle function under clean conditions. And then we get this large pollution plume. Particle concentrations go from 300 per cubic centimeter up to uh, uh, several thousand per cubic centimeter. Um, we get this contrasting engagement. So we call it a natural laboratory, uh, uh, deployment site, natural laboratory, getting the pristine, getting the heavy pollution. And then with Go Amazon, we can ask, what is the effect of pollution on? And I put the dot, dot, dot there because this is where you have on order of 50 scientists involved yeah perhaps more, and each one is filling in the dot, dot, dot with his or her own scientific uh, uh, question. Most of my personal questions um, are uh, 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 related to uh, uh, chemistry. Um, we will hear other talks that are related more to uh, clouds and other cl talks that are related more to modeling aspects of, of, of both. Uh, and other talks that are related to uh, uh, ecosystem type functioning. Okay, so, but they have in common then of trying to assess um, the, the influence of anthropogenic activities on these, on these cycles. Okay, so Manaus is a large source of pollution. You can see it here. This is a satellite image uh, looking at NO2, which is uh, an anthropogenic uh, pollutant. You can see it in Manaus. It's heading uh, uh, from east to west towards uh, the, 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 arm, uh, the arm site at T3. Um, this is the, the wind roses for one year at one uh, uh, kilometer. And you can see then that the winds are going from the east to the west in the dominant direction we expect. Okay, here are some aircraft data just to give you a sense of the plume. I, I don't have too much time to show you too many results in this kind of overview talk, but I did want to give you a sense of where the plume is. What's, con what's plotted here are the number of particles, these are aircraft observations, the number of particles per cubic centimeter, the, these are uh, on order of several hundred in the blue and uh, 5,000 or more in the white. And you can, so you can see the clean edges, the clean edges, and you can see this plume going right down the center. This was a local noon on the 13th of uh, March in the boundary layer, uh, uh, about uh, 400, 400, 500 uh, meters. And so that plume is really well defined and our research sites, T2, T3, and then the upwind sites, uh, the T0 sites. 
So this is crossing the plume. These are the particle concentrations. It's the same information as you have here, but represented in a different way, a standard kind of XY plot. So you can see in the plume, in the plume, in the plume. So you see it's a really uh, good natural laboratory where we can then ask, well, how do clouds form here? How do clouds form here? How do clouds form here? Number of radar systems in place to, to try to assess the different types of, of clouds that are, that are formed. This is a model of ozone. Here's um, Manaus. Uh, here's T2, T3. This is from Carlo Longo. This is ozone, modeled ozone. Uh, and so you can see how uh, the city is producing a lot of ozone. The data actually match this uh, pretty well. Um, but I'm showing the model because with the model you can see everything as opposed to just uh, uh, specific time points or locations. So here's the large ozone production. Uh, that's a combination of the oxides of nitrogen uh, that are emitted by the, the city, um, VOCs, uh, com organic compounds emitted by the plants, sunlight, water vapor. Okay, so with that, it's kind of where I'm finishing up. Um, take you back to the ideas. You see other talks, remembering this theme, what is the effect of pollution on, dot, 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 and different speakers are going to fill that dot, dot, dot in in different, different ways. Okay, um, with that, I'll conclude. We've heard about a number of uh, the sponsoring uh, uh, agencies for different uh, aspects of these uh, projects. Um, um, some of the largest sponsors are uh, DOE, FAPESPI, uh, uh, FAPIAM. Um, NSF is also contributing, and there are, there are other contributions in, in other ways, the Shuva Project, Aeroclima Project, all of this is done under uh, LBA, tie-ins to the Addo Project. Um, on, a, on a personal level, I'd uh, like to thank uh, FAPESPI, I guess in 2007, 2008, I was a recipient of one of your visiting researcher awards at University of Sao Paulo with uh, Paolo Artacho as, as my host, um, and more recently, uh, recipient from uh, Ministry of Science and Technology, the uh, Science Mobility Program um, for visiting uh, researcher. Uh, host is Rodrigo Souza at Amazon State University. So I'd like to thank uh, uh, Brazilians for that uh, personal support uh, as well. Um, and uh, I guess that's what I wanted to say, an introduction. If you want to get email for some reason for me on this, there is a, a, a Google group for that, and there are a couple of uh, uh, websites uh, uh, as, as well. Um, and that's uh, the introduction. Pass to Paula Artasha. Thank you. Yeah, just continuing. Uh, good morning to everybody. Just continuing the the story that Scott started. So basically, uh, it's important to understand that the DOE f main funding will go to the operation of the Manacapuru site, and mostly Brazilian funds have contributed to the study of background sites before the Manaus plumes, and that's very important. Like in the IPCC reports, if you don't know how was the pre-industrial climate, it's very hard to know what are the transformation for the future climate. So basically, uh, the Brazilian effort focus on trying to understand before the Manaus plume to help the interpretation of the data that were collecting uh, into the Manacapuru site. So basically, just emphasizing that uh, our task is to focus, our focus is to uh, study the aerosol life cycle, cloud life cycle, and the interactions with the ecosystem radiation balance and all the biology that drives uh, the Amazon basin functioning. That's an extremely complex uh, system that we are just now starting to get uh, unveiled. So as Scott mentioned, so this is the main wind directions. These are the several different sites. So this is the Manacapuru, a DOE operated site. And the Brazilian component have uh, set up several different stations upwind from Manaus. Uh, we start uh, at the Ato uh, Tower, that's a uh, large effort, uh, uh, partnership between German and Brazil, actually, uh, building up a 320 meters tall, tall tower. Right now, we have four 85 meters towers in operation, and we have done extensive measurements in one of these towers. Uh, FAPESP and also LBA uh, funded funds the operation of this tower that's called the ZF2 Ecological Reservation. It's about 55 kilometers north of Manaus. So this is about 150 kilometers north of Manaus. So basically, this the set of measurements on these two towers uh, uh, 
provide us a very nice characterization of how is the atmosphere before interacting with a large urban area like Manaus. And then FAPESP uh, funded the operation of uh, the T2 site, is uh, right on the other side of the Negro River. So we installed it and are operating since the beginning of the year, you know, uh, uh, a full container with measurements there and a tower uh, to study uh, what, is emit uh, what are the emissions of Manaus right over uh, the other side of the river. And then there is the DOE uh, T3 site in Manacaparu, where in addition to the, to the common containers, we also have three special containers dedicated for uh, intensive operational uh, periods uh, measurements. This is just an overview of the very busy containers. We, they are absolutely full of uh, aerosol mass spectrometers, VOC measurements, aerosol characterization studies, uh, another mass spectrometer, and they are fully loaded. And uh, we are operating some of these instruments in the in the primary forest for the last four or five years continuous. That is not a very trivial and very easy task. So let's go for the results. So that's a uh, scientific experiment and we have a lot of uh, very interesting results. So if you're looking for, starting looking for ozone concentration from January until the end of August at T3, you see a large variability, but of course, if you only look at this single site, we really is very hard to understand the process that are producing this ozone. And ozone is particularly important because it's a phytotoxic uh, gas, so that means it damages the vegetation, even hundreds of kilometers far from the emissions. But if you look for the ozone concentrations right across the river uh, from Manaus, and the ozone concentrations at the Atto site, at the T0 Atto site, you see that background concentrations are extremely low, especially in the wet season in Amazonia, average of 12 to 15 ppb, one of the lowest we can measure in any continental area of the world. And then they goes up to 20 to 40 parts per billion right after the Manaus uh, city. And then after uh, in Manacapuru, what you see is a mixture between periods where we have enhanced ozone and periods where we have destruction of ozone due to the different chemistry, the combination between NOx emissions and natural biogenic VOC emissions. So it's a very complex picture that without the characterization of the other sites will be very difficult to understand the full chemistry that's going on into um, the Manacaporu site. We see that, for instance, uh, the diurnal cycle of uh, ozone for the Manacaporu shows a very uh, nice enhancement of ozone in the middle of the day because of the increased radiation, of course. The same uh, at Manacapuru, but it's a completely different diurnal variation at the T0 site because of lack of NOx actually does not allow ozone either to be formed and even if you have a lot of radiation or to be destroyed because you have a high ozone concentration even during nighttime. So it's a very peculiar kind of atmospheric chemistry that does not happen in other uh, places. And in terms uh, for Tiwa, uh, right after Manaus, we see in the middle of the day a peak of ozone of, of about 15 parts per billion in the wet season that goes up to 40 parts per billion during the dry season. So this is uh, uh, concentration of ozone that could damage the vegetation and, and suppress photosynthesis, uh, influence carbon uptake by the forest, and so on, have a lot of different ecological aspects into the forest. So carbon monoxide is another important tracer. It's a tracer from biomass burning. You see that when you have uh, important biomass burning plumes, carbon monoxide goes very high concentration. And actually, for uh, atocyte, also for the two T2 site and also for Manacapuru. So there is a coupling between the three different sites that we can see through several different tracers that makes it uh, understand that there is a regional component in, in terms of atmospheric chemistry that is just now beginning to be uh, studied. And uh, for SO2, 
Uh, so two is important because it's a uh, uh, trace gas that's emitted when you, you burn, for instance, diesel with high uh, sulfur content in the city of Manaus, and it produces particles that influence strongly the radiation balance downwind of Manaus. And you see, for instance, a uh, significant concentration of SO2 uh, downwind uh, of the, the Manaus plume. But of course, uh, at the three, the three side, we have two problems. The first, either we don't have measurements of uh, SO2 at all because of instrumental problems, and uh, sometimes we have a relatively high concentration of SO2 uh, or no SO2 at all. So now we have to find out if this happens because of the very fast con conversion from SO2 to sulfate particles or if some other pathways uh, is, is in place. So this will allow us to do a very detailed study of the sulfur chemistry in a site of Amazonia that was never done. And aerosol light scattering, uh, for instance, in, in Manacapuru, uh, this is important because it, it influences directly the radiative forcing of aerosols. And we see uh, a very, very low light scattering during the wet season and a strong enhancement up to 150 to 200 inverse megameters during the dry season, mostly due to the biomass burning plume. And the size of the particles that are scattering this uh, radiation shows that in the wet season is mostly coarse mode particles, mostly biogenic in origin, and, and during the dry season, the angstrom exponent shows that this is very fine particles, long range transported from biomass burning. So even the nature of the particles at Manacapuru changes uh, with the season, not just with the, the influence of the Manaus plume. If you look to black carbon light absorption, uh, it's important because it hits, hits up the atmosphere, it burns out clouds, influences the precipitation uh, regime, shows that during the wet season, we, again, we have very small concentrations here. This is for T0, for the ZF2 site. And during the dry season, you see a huge increase from biomass burning during the to the uh, black carbon emissions. Up to four micrograms per cubic meter is higher than any urban area that we can see here in the United States. So very high concentration of black carbon. And in Manacapuru, we don't see this huge increase because uh, the background is always perturbed by the Manaus plume, as we can see here, uh, from February to June during the wet season. But again, we see this huge increase during the dry season due to biomass burning. An interesting uh, measurement is how much the total aerosol column is affected by the Manaus emissions. So we are measuring this using uh, some photometers before the Manaus plume and after the Manaus plume that get all the aerosol column from the sun to the ground. And very curiously, you see that the uh, Embrapa site before the Manaus plume and Manacapuru shows very similar aerosol optical sickness. And if you uh, plot one versus the other, it's only 6% increase in aerosol optical depth for both sides. And this is, in, this is completely unexpected. Of course, we have the episodes of the Manaus plume that are shown here, but we still have to investigate uh, how this scattering and absorption aerosol does not show up in the total aerosol column in terms of aerosol optical sickness. But the same is different if you look to the absorption aerosol optical sickness. So the component in the atmosphere that absorbs radiation you have an increase of factor of two from Manacapuru compared to the clean sites. So you see that the nature of the aerosol also changes, and this is an, an important scientific uh, issue for us to study the effects of all these components. And in terms of aerosol composition, we run several aerosol mass spectrometers from all these different sites. It's a lot of, uh, of data and work. And what you see, for instance, this is basically ATO compared to the, to the TIWA uh, site. Basically, you see in the, dry in, in the wet season, actually 
very similar concentrations. That's very surprising because you are downwind of uh, Manaus city and you are in a very pristine site at the Ato. And then during the, the, the dry season, you see the enhancement of biomass burning, but of course the enhancement affects both the clean site and also the urban site. If you just get an enlargement of, of uh, a small part of this from September 1st to September 13th, you see a very peculiar and very curious characteristic. You see an envelope of uh, aerosols from the background side overlapped by the Manaus plume. So this means you have a regional component ad uh, and additionally you get some spikes from the Manaus plume. So basically the regional aerosol component dominates even if you have a city of about 2 million inhabitants. That is completely unexpected for us in the beginning of the experiment. So this is an overview of the aerosol composition in terms of organic, sulfate, ammonia, nitrate, chloride for Ato, for the T2 site and for Manacaporu. So basically you see that in terms of organic component, they are very similar in between 60 to 75 percent. And also sulfate is similar in the wet season. We have a higher sulfate at T2 because of the lower concentrations, because of the very high precipitation rates, rains a lot, removes aerosols, so sulfur is fast replenished to the atmosphere. And then we also are studying carefully for every single day where the air mass that you are measuring for the all the different sites are coming from. This is an example uh, for air mass. These are biomass burning um, uh, fires uh, in, in Brazil, and these are the air mass trajectories showing that the smoke from biomass burning was quickly transported to the site in that very high peak we saw in the middle of September uh, at, at all the sites. And then uh, this is an, an overview of Ato and Tiwa, so basically showing that the percentage of organic aerosol and also for all the other components are very similar, showing that uh, there is a regional component that even if you put a seat of two million people in the middle of the forest, the forest show its present its presence uh, very quickly. So basically, just to finish, we are doing a a lot of different comparison between instruments for the different sites, making sure that we can compare their concentration. So this is, uh, this is basically uh, um, total amount of aerosol that is measured by aerosol mass spectrometry versus aerosol size distribution derived at mass. So you see that uh, in terms of quality assurance, most of the sites uh, are very, very well um, uh, represented. And this is uh, a plot that shows the degree of oxidation, how much uh, hydrogen or carbon uh, exist uh, or oxygen exists in the, in the carbonaceous aerosols. So you see that, uh, for instance, at Ato, we see a moderately uh, oxidation during the dry season. So part of the long-range transported biomass burning plumes uh, should be around here. So basically the primary emissions should be up there. But you see a moderate level of oxidation, and we are comparing this level of oxidation to understand the process that the aerosol suffers uh, all over these different sites. And if you look into a day-by-day -day basis, you see that, for instance, if you have uh, an episode of increasing aerosols here, in, uh, increasing number of aerosols here, this reflects in terms of SO2 concentration, in terms of light scattering, and also in terms of black carbon. Showing a very dynamic, in one single day, you see a lot of different process going on into the atmosphere that we're just now uh, starting to make uh, analysis. And then just to finish, uh, it's important to, to uh, analyze the interrelationship between the different measurements. So this is sulfate versus light scattering. This is aerosol organics versus light scattering. And the question is, what drives light scattering 
in, in other terms, what drives the radiative forcing of aerosol on, on the ground, you see that's a very, very complex picture. You see re different relationships for the wet season, different relationships for the dry season without biomass burning, and a completely different relationship during biomass burning. So it's a very dynamic system, both for sulfate and also uh, for organics. You see very different relationship between the different variables. And this is also show uh, between sulfate and black carbon for the wet season. We have a very high black carbon, but very low sulfate. So basically, uh, we have to understand the chemistry of the aerosols, and we have all the tools uh, to do that uh, from now on. And this is the aerosol size distribution from a few nanometers particles, five, six nanometer particles up to 10 micrometers. You see that you have episodes where you have T0 almost identical to T3, completely different instruments, completely different measurements. And sometimes you have enhancement of, of fine particles at Ato that we don't see at the, the in, uh, in Maracapuru that you don't see at Ato, and sometimes you see the reverse. So basically it shows a very dynamic in terms of transport, chemistry, and also processing of these aerosols that, we ha that will keep us busy for quite a long time. So basically, I think uh, the main conclusion is that Go Amazon is being a tremendously successful experiment, and that allows it just started. And I want to, to emphasize that now it's very clear that we need the Brazilian component for Go Amazon, that is on the T0, T2, and Embrapa sites, to fully understand what's happening in Manacapuru. Without the sites, w the science will be much, much less than we could afford right now. Thanks for the attention. We just found there was no coordinator <laughs> for the session. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll do it this time here. <laughs> the next <laughs> the next speaker, the next pair of speakers is on understanding the causes of the biases that determine the onset of the rainy season in Amazonia in climate models using Go Amazon Shuva measurements. It's by uh, Jose Orsini from the National Space Research Institute and Rong Fu from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Marien Gorsini is starting. And, and then after this session, we are going to have 15 minutes for questions regarding the preceding presentation and this presentation. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Jose Marengo, formerly at the National Institute for Space Research in Pins San Paulo, and now I just moved one month ago to the National Center for Early Warning and Monitoring of Natural Disasters, also in, in the state of San Paulo. This is going to be a shared presentation of our project uh, using the Amazon Shuba measurements to understand what causes the biases in the onset of the rainy season in Amazon. Uh, together with uh, Ron Fu from University of Texas and also collaborators from INPE, University of Texas, NASA Jet Propulsion, Propulsion Laboratory, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, I'm going to start with the, well, I have to get it. Uh, I think in terms of the Amazon region, it's kind of obvious to mention these kind of things at this stage, but one of the uh, tipping points in terms of using lentons uh, research. Uh, the problem with the Amazon regions, the possibility of the Amazon die back, actually, the changes in rainfall in there, uh, make us to think what's going on in there. 
is not just for the future, but what's going on in the present. In the last 10 years, we have had four extreme events. Each one of them refers as one in a century. So we have four centuries in less than 10 years, if we consider the stationarity of the time series. But uh, uh, in terms of impacts on the Amazon, a potential tipping point on global climate, the potential of diebacks in the Amazon rainforest, the increases of CO2, and as shown by early work by Cox, and then uh, updated uh, by different others, the impacts of the dry season length uh, affecting the climate in the region, and also the relation between the dry season length and the beginning of the rainy season. So uh, our project is basically observation and modeling, and is going to refer on in terms of improving modeling for the onset of the rainy season. Um, I have to get back of this. So the idea of this, science issues and objectives, global climate models run on seasonal climate forecasts, they still show large uncertainties on the forecast of the onset of the rainy season. And I know that the focus of Go Amazon is the Amazon, but whatever improvement we do uh, in terms of the, uh, I would say, the forecast of the onset of the rainy season is going to be useful not just for the Amazon region, but for any other region in, in, in South America, like for instance, uh, the onset of the rainy season is extremely hot issue right now in Sao Paulo because we are in the middle of a drought and if the rains doesn't start in the next two weeks, we are going to be really, really very in problem. What, why these models underestimate the variability of the rainy season onset and if this bias implies sensitivity of the rainy season when we think in terms of uh, future climate, not just seasonal forecast but also the climate change. And the idea of this proposal, I mean the project, is the use of the facilities and data from Go Amazon and Shuba field experiments to test and improve modeling, the particularly the uh, CES model from the US and the BEST model from Brazil. And the experiences we have with this kind of field work from the South American low level jet field experiments, also funded by FAPESP almost 11 years ago, too bad Brito is not here to make the advertising of FAPESP, but it has really helped a lot in terms of the usefulness of this kind of field data from field experiments in operational ac and research activities. Uh, and just give you one example of a situation that we have in 2001. In 2001, we have a situation where the rainy season didn't start on time. If you see, for instance, this is the ra observed rainfall. The rainy season in Sao Paulo in southeastern South America starts uh, at the end of October, beginning of November. And if you see each one of these lines is different realizations of the models. It's extremely spread. So this kind of predictability of the beginning of the rainy season is really low. And this is perhaps the most important information that farmers want. They don't want to know how much will it rain. They want to know when the rains are going to start. Okay? And this is 2001. 13 years later, we have a similar situation, and the models still show the same problems. So it meaning that there is something wrong in the models, or perhaps not well represented. Uh, Ron Fu is going to talk most of this on these details later on. But just uh, going back in terms of the beginning of the rainy season in the Amazon. Uh, during uh, 2005 and 2010, we have these two extreme uh, dra droughts. 2009 and 2012, and now in 2014, we have the floods in there. At the beginning, people start saying, oh, climate change, uh, deforestation. But later on came the other extreme, oh my goodness, it's not deforestation, what is in there? So all these issues came because on these droughts, the rainy season started late. On this, the rainy season started later. And of course, all of these have impacts in the population and the systems. Because uh, drought in here, the population were isolated. Floods in here the, uh, were also isolated because no way to get there. And then the food and uh, medicines came from the, from the government by helicopter. And also the impacts they have on the uh, ecosystems in terms of fires in 2005. The Amazon was sort of, uh, according to Luciana Gatti's paper that Brito mentioned in Nature, was sort of source of, of, of uh, carbon. 2010 was similar, 2009 was more close to a natural transition. So all of these issues that have to do with extension of the dry season, onset of the rainy season, they have several impacts in terms of, of uh, ecolo ecological and 
and human systems. And, and study we did as part of another FAPES friendly project. This is a Hofmuller diagram. If you notice, uh, this line in here, the dry season in there. So we notice for the last years, it's a big, uh, an increase of the length of the dry season. Of course, when you say the increase of the length of the dry season also means delay on the onset of the rainy season. So they are half empty, half full. But this has been shown, they have a natural variability in there. Okay? They have impacts on population. And also, there is a, a need, according to this, to improve this kind of understanding of this phenomenon because this kind of forecast in terms of uh, is going to rain or not and when is rain to start, it has to do with modeling. And we have to use as much as possible data, like Go Amazon and Shuba, to improve this kind of analysis. So whatever you see in terms of, of Go Amazon, is not just, at least for our side in, in Sao Paulo, it's not just the benefit of the Amazon, it's a benefit on the entire region, including regions like Sao Paulo. Okay, so now uh, Ronfu is going to take over. Thank you. So uh, follow the uh, result that uh, uh, Jose just showed, that uh, increase of a uh, wet season onset. Uh, we're trying to understand what caused such inc uh, increase of dry season lands, delay of wet season onset, and also how well the uh, global climate model that participated the IPCC fifth assessment could uh, represent this kind of change. So uh, what we uh, found is, uh, first of all, the CMIP-5 model, these are the climate model participate in the IPCC fifth assessment, substantially underestimate the variability of dry season lens and uh, wet season onset, perhaps understand their future change as well. In particularly, the observation suggests that the uh, wet dry season lens has been increased at the rate approximately one week per decade and since the later uh, 70s. And this is mainly due to increase of uh, dryness uh, during the dry season. And uh, if we look at the CMIP-5 model, and we recognize that this kind of strong delay of a uh, wet season onset could be due to natural variability, as uh, Jose just mentioned. So we look at, uh, uh, we look at whether <coughs> the climate model could uh, simulate this kind of natural variability, perhaps also with the influence of anthropogenic forcing. So we look at about uh, 4,500 years of uh, natural variability simulation and another 1,500 years of the uh, historical simulation produced by a model. And then we pro uh, look at the probability distribution of these 26 years trend. The bottom line here, main point here is uh, the model could not uh, even with the 6,000 years of simulation together, the model could not uh, reproduce the observed delay of the wet season onset. And if you look at the, uh, the projected change on the strongest emission scenario, which is uh, RCP 8.5, <coughs> you see the wet season onset delay. However, the, uh, it's still not enough compared to what has already been observed. So now the question is, uh, what causes such large observed variation of the wet season onset? Why do CME5 model underestimate such a change? And uh, what could uh, uh, we, how can we use the Go Amazon and the Shua data to clarify these questions? So the hypothesis here is uh, uh, inadequate representation of a shallow cloud and the deep convective type and their relationship to aerosol land surface and atmospheric circulation are the par at least a part of the root cause for such low climate variability in the climate model. So to test this hypothesis, we will e evaluate the evolution of the cloud convection and uh, uh, latent radiative heating and circulation during dry to wet season transition and their variation. We also want to look at the response of the cloud convection to the under their diabetic heating response to change of land surface aerosol and the circulations. So 
<coughs> there's a large body of uh, uh, research uh, presented in the literature and basically suggests the white, dry to white season uh, transition is controlled both by external forcing, which is the sea surface temperature anomalies, moisture transport, South Atlantic convergence along subtropical jet, et cetera. But <coughs> what get the transition started is really within the Amazon. And there are evidence suggests that uh, the increase of photosynthesis by rainforest in response to increased solar radiation, increase evapotranspiration, reduce the stability of the lower troposphere, which increase the probability frequency of the convection, produce diabetic seating, which drive the atmospheric circulation and the moisture transport. Um, the increase of moisture transport in turn for the increase of convection of rainfall. And however, the role of a cloud aerosol in this previous study are still not clear enough. So <coughs> to uh, clarify the role of cloud and aerosol, and we look at a more recent, a larger suite of uh, uh, satellite data set, and basically use these data set looking at the evolution of the atmospheric energy water cycle. I wouldn't go to it too much into detail, but just to show what kind of data we use. And then the ecosystem and uh, uh, biomass burning and their influence on carbon cycle. And uh, uh, water isotopic composition, which tells you the sources of the water vapor and uh, cloud and uh, atmospheric buoyancy. So what these uh, data, uh, data results suggest, first of all, it confirms the importance of the uh, rainforest in initiate white season onset. You can see that from a very uh, rich, heavy isot water isotope. That's due to transpiration by plants. And second of all, <coughs> this analysis unraveled the import uncovered the importance of a shallow convection. And we shallow convection increased first as the ET increase, and which pump moisture into free troposphere and that's the condition favorable for increased deep convection and the rainfall. So both the shallow and the deep convection act as an engine that drives the dry to wet season transition, at least at the early stage of this transition. And the aerosol could influence both the shallow and the deep cloud. So now, uh, so this uh, recent analysis, uh, in addition, besides to uh, provide more concrete evidence suggests the importance of rainforest to the uh, dry to wet season transition. It also identifies another important element of this transition, which is the uh, importance of a shallow convection that transport moisture. Aerosol could influence both shallow cloud and the deep uh, convection. Therefore, we have a better understanding of the role of aerosol in determining the dry to wet season transition. So the next question is, uh, what caused delayed white season onset? So uh, basically, uh, our data analysis suggests this is a composite of the uh, atmospheric humidity, net radiative cooling, late, uh, net radiative heating, uh, anomalous latent heating, and the vertical velocity uh, for multiple years. Uh, what we find is uh, the delay of the wet season onset is a, a, a result of a persistent dry anomalies starting from previous wet season. Usually, it started from early ending of the previous wet season. That leads to land surface, uh, dry land surface, which suppress low cloud uh, and as well as deep cloud, and leading to radiative cooling, and this De this uh, decrease of low cloud and land surface dry dryness together suppress deep convection, which reduce latent heating. So both anomalous latent, uh, both anomalous radiative cooling and the latent cooling uh, act together to reinforce the subsidence in the atmosphere, which suppress rainfall. So. Uh, more specifically, what is the role of aerosol uh, in this processes, in this transition? So we know that uh, during uh, 
the late wet season onset, you can see from satellite that the fire season become much longer and the aerosol optical depths increase strongly in October, November. And also, we expect a decrease of cloudiness. <coughs> so uh, the question is uh, how, uh, how aerosol influence the cloud. Uh, in this case, we look at the deep convection. So what we did here is uh, we combine ICCP data that gives you the convective life cycle with polar orbiter satellite uh, trim, uh, rainfall radar, and uh, MODIS. Uh, uh, what <coughs> we found is uh, we use this uh, partial least square regression, which address looking at the relative importance of a various variable. And we found uh, in terms of a rain rate, that surface relative humidity, which is very much influenced by uh, land uh, vegetation response. And the wind shear played more dominant role in determining the rain rate. The aerosol do not seem to have a sig statistically significant impact on the rain rate. However, the aerosols can significantly, even substantially increase the latent heating pro uh, of the atmosphere, which drives the circulation. And especially in the middle upper troposphere, and this is a very effective uh, latent heating that could drive the circulation. So what, does, uh, what do Go Amazon data show? The, the data I just presented is based on the satellite data. The question is, uh, can we uh, trust it? So the, uh, the preliminary analysis of the IOP1 uh, suggests that we use the cloud radar. So what this uh, analysis suggests is uh, the uh, cloud ice variance is dominated by the uh, vertical wind shear and the relative first order, and then the relative humidity, surface relative humidity, and the aerosol appear to be equally important in terms of explaining the variance of the cloud, convective cloud ice mount. And for drizzle size rainfall, because this is a cloud data, vertical wind shear relative humidity are important, and the aerosol do not seem to have a significant influence. So this is a, at least loosely consistent with the satellite data we showed uh, just before in the previous slide. So what about the global, over global rainforest uh, or humid tropic land? So the satellite data provide, uh, again, broadly consistent result uh, compared to the Go Amazon uh, uh, ground-based analysis. So specifically what we found is uh, during the growing stage of the convective system, the wind shear and uh, uh, surface rel low tropospheric relative humidity uh, controls the uh, ice versus uh, liquid water ratio, which is an indicator of the convective intensity. However, during the mature and the decay stage, aerosol played as important a role as a uh, low tropospheric relative humidity and the wind shear. So this is, again, broadly consistent <laughs> with uh, the uh, preliminary analysis of the Go Amazon data. Of course, that doesn't mean we can readily scale the result of Go Amazon uh, data observation to global uh, rainforest area or global tropical uh, land. And because, first of all, not all the convective systems are created equal. Second of all, the influence of aerosol on cloud and the convection vary with uh, different climate regime. So to uh, provide a more solid uh, foundation for scale up the Go Amazon data, we think Shua data uh, it really provides excellent bridge between Go Amazon and uh, uh, between Go Amazon uh, in situ measurement and uh, uh, Amazon basin as a, uh, South American as a whole and as well as the global tropical land. So the SHUA data uh, since 2010 measures uh, convection in different climate regime and different convective time type. What we plan to do is uh, looking for each convective type and the climate regime. Uh, we're going to evaluate the satellite measurement against the SHUA measurement and to scale up the result of a Go Amazon data. So this will be last slide. Uh, transparency. 
So question is, uh, why climate model fail to reproduce the large variability of wet season onset? So uh, this preliminary comparison suggests, first of all, the, uh, this is a CESM forced by observed sea surface temperature. First of all, the previous wet season did not end early as observed. Second of all, the land surface was too wet and the shallow convection was too strong uh, during the uh, dry to wet season uh, transition. As a result, the anomalous radiative cooling and the latent cooling are substantially underestimated. So this would not, so the model did not capture the very important positive feedback from cloud, land surface, and the convection, and therefore failed to uh, reproduce the large variability of the delay of the wet, wet season onset. So uh, to summarize, uh, shallow, uh, the preliminary analysis uh, from the Argo Amazon project suggests shallow cloud influence the condition favorable for deep convection. Both deep and the sh uh, shallow convection influence raining season onset over Amazonia. Uh, reduced cloud along with the surface dryness reduce deep convective, uh, deep convection and rainfall. The anomalous radiative and the latent cooling provide a positive feedback that reinforce the atmospheric subsidence and the dry conditions. Aerosol may dampen this convective positive feedback by increased deep convective ice and the latent heating in the middle upper troposphere. The CESM appear to underestimate the surface dryness and cloud reduction, which may lead <coughs> to weak rainfall reduction. And these bias probably contribute to the weak variability of the raining season onset in the model. So uh, finally, we will, next step, we're planning to analyze Go Amazon, the IOP phase two, and uh, SHUA data, and look at the uh, CESM with improved the low cloud simulations. And also looking at uh, 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 C <coughs> the uh, NCAR community climate model with uh, uh, resolve of mesoscale convection and finally explore the uncertainty of quantification in collaboration with uh, the uh, Steve Gan and the Ruby Liang's group. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank all the speakers this morning, and I'd like to invite Dr. Paulo Artas, Scott Martin, Marengo, and Wong Fu for a 15 minutes debate or questions and answer as you wish. Yeah, please. No questions? Oh, please. Uh, in terms of aerosol influence on convection. Yeah. Uh, are, the, are these, in other words, are these sort of universal uh, findings that you can easily extend to all the tropics, or are there uh, fundamental differences in the relationship between, say, the, the biospheric component and the atmospheric component that may take not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in terms of aerosol influence on convection, the, these uh, three continental show broadly similar behave. However, there are significant difference between the three continent. For example, over the uh, Southeast Asia, the aerosol influence seem to be stronger than uh, elsewhere. And the Congo is perhaps the second strong, you, you see aerosol impact on deep convective system is stronger than Amazon. 
So relatively speaking, the convective system we're looking at, uh, these are the big convective system. system. Uh, they're over Amazon. They tend to be shorter lived and uh, uh, s smaller. And the aerosol influence tend to be uh, somewhat less uh, of uh, pronounced in the uh, Amazon. Sir, can you comment on the can on the um, coast actually taking mm -hmm. the addition of the aerosols, the, the uh, coupling via the latent mm -hmm. heat connections, the, the, so the ET, the, mm -hmm. uh, the connectivity between ET and the, and, uh, and the scurry uh, <coughs> convection. Can, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm not aware of any systematic study on what control wet season onset over Congo. And, but I would say that because Amazon is the uh, biggest rainforest, so the ET perhaps provide uh, more or higher fraction of uh, water vapor in the atmosphere than, <coughs> say, Congo or Southeast Asia. So relative speaking, the rainforest influence on white season onset, uh, I would expect more important over Amazon than over Congo or Southeast Asia. Uh, the study both Jose, uh, Jose and I show are actually for southern Amazon, including uh, it's a, like the transition between Amazon and uh, seasonal season. yeah, forest Monte Grasso. So I think the uh, delay of the wet season onset there could <coughs> be even more, uh, uh, could be stronger because there the land use influence becomes stronger and uh, uh, the wet dry season is already uh, pretty long. So I would expect that area is more vulnerable for this okay. kind of. Let me, let me add this, uh, particularly for the southern part of the Amazon and also the South American monsoon, including Southeastern South America, uh, for instance, where San Paulo is located. We have to have some sort of weather events interaction, like the moisture coming from the Amazon and the cold fronts coming from the south. And usually at this time of the year, they get together and then you have the beginning of the rainy season. You see, and uh, the moisture coming from the Amazon, where that's where the Amazon uh, forests, they have a major role in there. You see, I mean, it's not like, for instance, if the Amazon disappears, San Paulo will be right. No, because we still have moisture coming from the south the cold fronts, and that's something that at this time is, is not going on because the fronts go to south of Brazil and then go to the ocean because we have a transit in there, basically a high pressure center with, for a few days of duration they are there. So I would say that the fact, I mean, the forest is extremely important from one of the contributions and perhaps the most important region affected by a late onset is the southern part of the Amazon. The northern part of the Amazon where Manaus is located may have some problems, but the more impacts are in the southern part. Yeah, I would like to add on to Jose just mentioned. He pointed out a very, another very important uh, cause of the delay of the wet season onset, which is a poleward shift of the southern hemispheric subtropical jet. And that's also another important reason onset has been delayed. Uh, the, 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 the effect of that poleward shift of subtropical jet is reduce the kind of a weather activity Jose mentioned. Uh, to, for, so reduce that kind of activity, which in turn would reduce the uh, frequency of the raining events. And that uh, poleward shift of the subtropical jet is also very much underestimated by current climate model.
Well, no more questions. So I'd like, please. I can try to answer it uh, very clear. Uh, uh, there is a paper from Luis Augusto Machado in ACPD right now that shows a very strong effect of black carbon on, on convection and on precipitation rate. So basically the short answer is the speciation of the aerosols plays, yes, a major role. Their absorption uh, capability to nucleate cloud droplets are very different, depending on their age, depend on their size, depend on many other uh, different aspects, and they definitely influence cloud formation and development. Uh, the, the work of Luis Augusto Machado focused on black carbon because the, there was the available measurements, but of course now we will have the capability to do that to the organic aerosols with sulfate, nitrates, and many, many other species with the beautiful set of the Go Amazon project. Yeah. I, I guess I would just continue that theme. Um, an early experiment, which was we did in 2007, 2008, uh, uh, Maze 08, our big question, one of our big questions, was where do these submicron particles uh, come from under clean conditions? And the answer is they're tied to the emissions from uh, uh, plants. So the hydrocarbons that are emitted, the isoprenes, the terpenes, these undergo atmospheric oxidation um, to make lower volatility products. And these are things that are then condensing to make the 100 nanometer, uh, 150 nanometer, uh, uh, 50 nanometer particles of the cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, so I, that's, I left that out because it was a little, little bit detailed, but that's in that kind of Gaia hypothesis that I was mentioning that the, the plants emit the VOCs, which make the particles, which lead to the clouds, which lead to the water, which lead to the plants, and interrupting anything in that cycle could have uh, uh, a lot of consequences on uh, the types of clouds that are formed and subsequent rainfall uh, patterns. Well, I'd like again to thank all the speakers of this morning. We are now going to have a 15 minutes coffee break, and then please come back to the second quest session for t this morning. Thank you. Very good. Excellent. Sorry?